racing now. I wish I win from last. A spectacular TJ win. Giga kick, giga kick down the outside wins the Everest. Shinzo and Ryan Moore have drawn clear to win the Golden Slipper. With Tim Gilbert and Julie Snook, this is Racing Dreams. Hello and welcome to Racing Dreams, and they do come true. What about today? We've got the Cox Plate. We've got a huge day at Ramwick as well, Jules. We do. Good morning to you at home and welcome back, Timmy. It is so nice to have you back in studio. You've been gallivanting overseas. Well, I'll go with a gallivanting. Racing Dreams it's, has gone global. It's actually, it's called on assignment. I've been on assignment. You wait till you see what we've got for you today. <laughs> I'm so looking forward to it. We do have a big show, a big day of racing. Let's have a look. Apprentice jockey Zach Lloyd is chasing his own piece of history today in the race where legends are made, the Cox Plate. Royal Randwick hosts the $2 million Spring Champion Stakes Day and the third running of the Invitation, a full preview just around the corner. And Racing Dreams hits the UK. Tim heads to Newmarket to catch up with legendary trainer William Haggis and we'll also have some breaking news on his next Aussie Autumn campaign. Well, it's amazing how one race can make so many people happy. That's an understatement. Yeah, it, it certainly was extra special when Manal won the gym crack uh, a few weeks ago. And, of course, it signalled a triumphant return for Tommy Berry. So good to see Tommy back in the saddle. The team at Newgate were over the moon, as was the trainer, Michael Friedman. Good morning to you, Mr Friedman. Good morning. How are we? Yeah, real good. And look, looking back just a few weeks ago, it was a really gutsy win by her and uh, sets up a path, hopefully, to the Golden Slipper. Yeah, that'd be the, the plan, Tim. Oh, She's, um, she went straight to the paddock after, after winning the gym crack, and um, yeah, which is, what, about a month ago now. Um, she'll have another couple of weeks out, and then that gives us plenty of time to have her back in uh, and start getting her sort of prepped up for the for the autumn, which, you know, probably for her will kick off sort of late January, early February, something like that. We just mentioned it in the opener there to have Tommy Berry back in the saddle as well. Uh, a long stint for him on the sidelines. You know, you've, you've worked with him closely over the years. How good was it to have him back? Yeah, it was terrific. I mean, you know, he... Um, he, he had to sort of do that stint on the sidelines and, you know, I think, um, I think under the circumstances he coped with it pretty well because going from sort of hero to zero like he did uh, all of a sudden was a bit of a shock to the system. But to his credit, he, he sort of toughed it out and we had a lot of, you know, phone conversations over that period of time and, um, you know, it was just, it was great to be sort of part of um, his return to the saddle. Obviously, we've got quite a bit of history mm. going back many years. So um, it was a big thrill for me and, and obviously it was for Tommy as well. It's been a pretty good spring, Michael, for you. Yeah, look, not too bad. I mean, it, we've got a young, sort of growing, developing stable. Um, you know, it's no secret that a lot of... A large percentage of my stable are, are very young horses, a mixture of sort of two and three-year-olds. I haven't got many older than that, so... It takes a bit of time to develop them, but I'm, I'm really happy with the way the stable's building. And, um, you know, we've been thereabouts in a few of the good races and there's still a bit, bit of a way to go. So, fingers crossed, we might be able to uh, get a few more of the spring spoils. A 10 race card today, uh, but much cooler conditions today. We've also had that little bit of rain this week. It feels like uh, we've gone back to winter a little bit. It's not exactly the, the hot days we've had the last few carnival days. No, but, it, but it's quite nice. I mean, I, 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 despite the fact that I did eight years in Singapore where it's so hot and humid, I, I'm not a big fan of the heat. So being a bit cooler certainly suits me. Um, and I think the horses probably appreciate it too. So, yeah, it is a bit, a bit uh, sort of like a Melbourne spring rather than a Sydney spring at the moment with the weather, but it uh, should be perfect for today. What about Mumbai Muse today? Yeah, it's a nice race for her. Um, you know, we, we, we accepted with her for Mooney Valley today as well, and I had to make a call by Wednesday, you know, uh, as to whether she was going to head down there or stay here, but decided to keep her here just purely for the fact that, it, that both races look very similar um, on paper, and it was probably just uh, a little easier to keep her here in her own backyard where she's run, t you know, two really good races over the 1,200 at Randwick. Uh, at a first two starts back this spring. So, 
Um, sets up quite nicely, I think. Um, she should be able to get a, a good run just behind the speed somewhere. And Tommy trialled her here last Friday, and you know I thought she trialled well. So fingers crossed. She's she's been a bridesmaid a few times now. We're still trying to break that uh, maiden with her, and fingers crossed she can do it today. We've also got the Group Two calendar Presnell. A bit of a tough draw today, though. Yeah, he's he's one horse that just hasn't had much luck at all with the barriers. Uh, this this preparation, he's, he's drawn a few of these wide gates, and today does present a little more difficult again. Um, there does appear to be good speed in the race, which which may sort of give Tommy the opportunity to slot in somewhere just behind the speed somewhere. I'll have to leave that up to him. And we have put a set of visors on him today because he's been a little bit wayward and stargazing his last couple of runs. So he's worked in them. And um, I think the key is if he can just find a nice spot where he's not posted wide, um, I think he'll appreciate getting to the mile here at Ramwick. Yeah, nice little setup that you've got there now. You've taken over Mark Newnham's stables as well. Some new day yards, Michael. Yeah, yeah, we um, we took those stables over about two months ago, um, and there was a, enough room to uh, to put in six nice covered yards. So it gives gives us capacity here now for about fifty five horses, which that's plenty for me. I don't really want to be trying to train any more than that. That's just a nice manageable number. Um, so yeah, it's 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 Sydney and and Ramwick now is very much the base, and looking forward to continuing to build the team over the next uh, couple of years ahead. All right, Michael. Well, we certainly appreciate your time. It's nice to see you nice and relaxed on a Saturday morning too. Sometimes you're a little bit more tense in the shoulders. I didn't realise. I <laughs> thought I was always this way. Good to see you, Michael. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Well, apprentice Zach Lloyd has fast risen up the Sydney ranks this year, crowned Sydney's leading apprentice. He also took out the Bart Cummings medal. Today he faces his biggest stage yet on board the Chris Waller train to militarise in the $5 million Cox Plate. Militarise is on firing right up here on the English side. Draws away for an emphatic victory. Militarise is heading top gear. Militarise moved up now, takes the lead late, and Militarise blows them away in the champagne stakes. End cap, cylinder, Militarise late! Oh, barnstorming finish by Militarise! Quite surreal, the, the whole week and, and the opportunity I've, be, I've been given to obviously ride Militarise on the Cox Plate. I'm just taking it every, every day and, yeah, enjoying the moment. My, my rise to the ranks, I, I believe, it's not a fluke. <laughs> I've been very lucky with the opportunities I've been given from Godolphin and stables like Michael Wayne and John Hawkes. But you always need the support, no matter how, how good you, you think you might be, you need the other people to believe it as well. So very, very lucky to obviously be given the opportunities and, and militarising the Cox Plate, it's just um, the icing on, on top. It was a good experience going down to Melbourne on, on the Tuesday for the breakfast with the best. Um, I was able to go down and, and, and meet a lot of people and, and ride my horse for, for Saturday. It was a great, great morning. I was obviously lucky enough to ride with Stephen Arnold, who, who's actually won himself a Cox Plate. And so he, he taught me the, the ins and outs of Mooney Valley and, and the two gallops we did together. So I was, I was lucky in that regard. And yeah, I was just trying to take in my surroundings, but at the same time, in short, I, I did the work correctly and militarised gallop nicely. I rode Militarise first up in his preparation this time in, in the run to the Rose, and, and he ran very well, albeit it was only 1,200 metres. He's then um, come on to win the Golden Rose, which was a great run, and then just last start, he, he didn't run very well in the Caulfield Guineas, but obviously Chris Waller was sinking many steps ahead, and, and he's put me on in the Cox Plate with the light weight, and very lucky to, to be given the ride. Henry Field, the owner of Militarise, he gave me the call on a Sunday morning after the Caulfield Guineas, so it, it turned out to be a great Sunday and, um, yeah, very, very thankful. I'm normally the youngest in the, in the room these days. Uh, I started quite young at 17, um, so yeah, to be the youngest rider in the Cox Plate, it's, it's, a, it's a privilege and yeah, it's, um, it's an accolade in itself, so I'm very, very happy with myself and, and the way I've been riding.
My parents do get quite nervous, especially my mum. She's a bit of a nervous wreck. But she's getting better with time and, and the more opportunities I've been given. I think she was a bit nervous in the beginning. Obviously, you never know how you're going to cope with the pressure and the, and the big races, but she's seeing me to get a little bit better. My dad, he's always good in, in the big races. He's obviously been there and done that. So uh, I'll be listening to what he says, but I don't think he's won himself a cox plate. So. <laughs> Darren Beeman, he's, he's been fantastic in my rise this past year. He's, he's really grown to be a father figure in Sydney for me. And lucky enough, he's coming. He's actually flying down Friday with me to, to walk Mooney Valley. He knows everything about Mooney Valley. So I'll learn a lot then, I, I can imagine. And yeah, he's, he's been great. I think the good barrier is going to really help with the, with the nerves, just knowing that the, the first furlong or two should, should fall into place and um, yeah, just ride the race the last 800 metres. This racing update is brought to you by Bet365, the world's favourite online betting brand. Chances are you're about to lose. Of course, a big day ahead today. Will Alligator Blood win the Weight for Age Championship of Australia as he lines up in the Cox Plate for Jerry Harvey and Gay Waterhouse? Meanwhile, Tom Kitten will start as a short price favourite in the Spring Champion Stakes at Royal Randwick. Daily Telegraph journalist Shane O'Cast joins us from the newsroom. We're going to have a look at Sydney in just a tick, but Cox Plate Day. How do you see it going? Yeah, morning, Tim. Morning, Julie. Well, it's it's one of those days, isn't it? Cox Plate Day, Derby Day, Everest Day, Melbourne Cup Day. You think about them that for the whole year. And, uh, look, I think it's brought together a pretty good field. All the interest, I would imagine, is at the top and bottom. And, of course, with Alligator Blood there in the middle, uh, particularly at the top there, Tim, with this Hong Kong horse, Romantic Warrior. Um, look, it's it's been a pretty checkered build-up to the race. He missed a trial in Hong Kong because of a typhoon. And then he uh, obviously came to Australia. He was extremely underwhelming at his first run here. But there was improvement expected, as James McDonald Donald pointed out uh, before the race, but he'd have to improve quite a bit because uh, this is a, a red-hot field. Uh, the trainer says he's 90 to 95%. Uh, whether that's good enough to beat uh, a Cox Plate field, we'll, we'll find out today. But um, look, an interesting 12 horses. Only six of them have raced at Mooney Valley, so six haven't, and only three of those six that have been there have won. So it's a very tricky track. A lot of great horses have won a Cox Plate, but a lot of good horses have been beaten by, by the layout and, and how the race is run. So usually the best horse wins. I had a look at a stat this morning, guys. 41% of favourites win the Cox Plate. So if you're backing Romantic Warrior on Bet365, I think he's about $3.60. So you've got a 41% chance of winning. Can Alligator Blood deliver Gay Waterhouse her first Cox Plate? Well, he, he's such a bulldog, isn't he, Julian? He's got a great pattern like uh, most of the Gay Waterhouse, going back to Tommy Smith, sort of horses do. They race up on pace. They're incredibly hard to get past. He's a he's a lot like Desert War, one of Gay's old warriors uh, back in the past because he can... Sometimes he can make the running if he has to, but if he's not, he'll take over uh, in, at the turn when all the pressure is applied. And you know he won't lie down. So if Romantic Warrior or any of these three-year-olds are going to get past him, they're really going to have to dig deep because uh, this is one horse that is absolutely primed and he doesn't like losing. Jules had a chat with Zach Lloyd. We just heard that wonderful little yarn. He's on militarise. <laughs> I'll tell you what, he can ride. Uh, it's incredible. Uh, great story uh, there on Zach. Uh, I was looking at his stats. His uh, first runner was a Dolby uh, in Queensland three years ago. It actually <laughs> won. Uh, Zach's had more rides at Nanango than he's had at uh, Mooney Valley. So that's a, a big test. But you've got to think from his point of view, he's ridden in an Everest and now he'll be riding in a Cox Plate. So as he said, it's, it's not a fluke. He's got two of the biggest stables uh, supporting him. And uh, look, he's, he'll do a great job on militarised. The horse is a real chance. I mean, if you take out the Caulfield Guineas run, uh, he won two legs of the Triple Crown. He won the Golden Rose. He's by done deal, so he's going to stay. And he's got no weight on his back. Three-year-olds don't win the Cox Plate every year, but they've got a very good record of running a place. So, um, yeah, I, I could imagine if it gets tight, militarises, he's either going to be in the finish uh, or, or, he could, or he could actually win. I mean, with that weight and his class. Ja Moreira has spoken so highly of this cult as well, but when did a three-year-old last win the Cox Plate? Well, you have to go back to um, Seamus Award uh, back in 2003, uh, So You Think, uh, won a Cox Plate. Savabile won a Cox Plate. So they have been very high-class horses. Admittedly, Seamus Award was a maiden, but he, he was still a pretty good horse. Uh, whether militarises up in sort of that level, well, we'll find out what he does after that today. But, um, look, the weight advantage is, is hugely significant. I mean, they are racing... At, you know, proven seasoned runners. Uh, but you don't know where they're going to end up in the next few years' time. So 49 at this point in time might be a luxury. We're going to be live at the Rose Hill Gardens next week. No doubt you'll be there with us for Golden Eagle Day. Uh, what about today's Spring Champion Stakes Day in Sydney? 
Yeah, well, the spring champion's always been a, um, a good guide to the derby, but it's also the culmination of the staying races uh, for three-year-olds in Sydney, the classic races. Always throws up a good winner. This year, most people are expecting Tom Kitten to win, and, and it would be good to see the horse actually break through because he's been terribly unlucky. He's got a, uh, a pattern where he goes a long way back and he needs a very good ride, and I'm not saying that he hasn't got the good rides, but the timing just hasn't been right on the horse. And, look, the big problem with him today potentially is barrier one. Um... You'd prefer one at the 2,000 metre start than, say, 20, but by the same token, for a horse who needs clear running and has to make a good, sustained run at the finish, it's going to be a little bit of an issue maybe for Adam Hieronymus uh, to uh, to get him home. But, he's, look, he's the best horse in the race and he really deserves this. I think I'd like to see him win. We also have the $2 million invitation. Cathy O'Hara has just been in such great form. But looking back, Karen McAvoy, he's won the first two runnings of this race, so he's eyeing his third straight invitation, the $2 million man there. Yeah, absolutely. He's brought together a great field there, Julie. Two horses. This is the first time we'll see the Everest form uh, in action since the big race. Uh, Alcohol Free and Espiona obviously going around. Alcohol Free will find this a lot different uh, in, in her favour, stepping up to 1,400 with a different tempo. Espiona's record at 1,400 is incredible. And you mentioned Cathy O'Hara there. Well, she won the Jockey's Premiership, first female rider to do it back in 2004, 2005. They used to call her the Golden Girl. Um, tell you what, she's having a golden run at the moment because she's uh, won on Palmetto. Uh, she won the Epsom uh, this month. Uh, as well and she's riding Alentia who's, who's a bit of a long shot but look Alentia's got the Chris Waller polish there was a talk that she was winks like when she won at uh, Rose Hill first up it's been a bit disappointing since to some degree but if Alentia brings her best look, you don't know Kathy O'Hara could be in for another two million dollar payday here OK, now you've mixed your form with your tipping. You've had some wonderful success and some things that will <laughs> just wipe off the tape. Not that there's tape anymore. Who have you got for us today? OK, well, look, I've got to stick with um, the big race today in Sydney. It's the invitation. I think it's Espiona's race. Um, she's been fantastic all the way through. She's a little bit, I wouldn't say hot and cold, but the best Espiona would win most races. And, uh, look, against the mares today, dropping back from the Everest and stepping up in distance, I think Espiona's going to win. Shane O'Cass, we are the winners today. Thank you so much for joining us. It's lovely to see you. We'll catch up with you next week. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Tim. We'll write that down. This racing update is brought to you by Bet365, the world's favourite online betting brand. What are you the, really gambling with? This is Racing Dream. Stay with us. Coming up, we head to the United Kingdom and visit the Tattersalls Horse Sale at Newmarket. Find out more about this iconic institution and its Australian connection. See you soon. Welcome back to Racing Dreams. Well, I have made my way to the United Kingdom. Here we are in Newmarket. It is absolutely phenomenal. Hundreds and hundreds of years. This has been the centrepiece for thoroughbreds in the United Kingdom. And joining me is Jason Singh, the marketing manager of Tattersalls. Yeah, we've, uh, we've established in 1766, um, which is 257 years ago, based in Hyde Park Corner in London originally and uh, more recently, probably just over 100 years, started selling horses here in Newmarket. And uh, yeah, so it's, um, yeah, it's been, uh, you know, great history and, and great to be part of, uh, you know, the history of Newmarket. We're going to hear from William Haggis a little later on in this show. Tell us about this particular sale, because we've, we've come in at a good timing, because uh, this, is, this is a really important sale on the calendar now. Yeah, this is the, the world's largest horses and training sale, roughly 1,750 horses this year. Um, the Australian market has sort of discovered it about 15 years ago via Chris Waller, who initially, when he started training, started coming up here and buying a few cheap tried horses, taking them to Australia, realising that there was a little bit of upside to be had. And it's got to a point now where we would probably hope to sell in the region of 40 to 50 horses to the Australian market um, this week. And, you know, there's a, the great thing about this, this sale is it attracts buyers from 30 to 40 different countries every year. And it's a real mixing pot of uh, different nationalities and all of them competing, you know, for, for all the horses. So, so the Australians won't have it easy. There's plenty of competition from, from Saudi Arabia, other Middle Eastern countries such as Bahrain and Dubai, um, as well as America and Hong Kong. 
you know, it's a competitive marketplace, but uh, the Australians do seem to have quite a quite a good um, spending uh, dollar behind them at the moment. Oh, well, they're well represented, aren't they? Because we have uh, Gay Waterhouse, Adrian Bott's representatives here. We have Chris Waller's representatives here. Lots of the major trainers. Yeah, I'd say all the, the, the major trainers will be active in the market in some way. Um, COVID meant that a few of them stopped coming up here for, for two or three years, but this year we've seen that uh, a lot of them have returned, um, and even those that are not got a presence up here on the ground uh, are on the phones to local agents and uh, vets and, 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 and working behind the scenes. Well, thanks for having us here, Jason. And uh, look, it uh, is a great environment. I can see why you came out from Melbourne many, many years ago and decided to stay in Newmarket. Yeah, it was, it's 25 years ago that I, I came to the UK. And uh, yeah, got the job here at Tats 23 years ago. And uh, yeah, loving every minute of it. It's a great place to work and uh, you know, a great place to live. Yeah, we are fully international here on Racing Dreams. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, that, uh, that roast lunch tasted absolutely <laughs> lovely. William Haggis is coming up later in the show and we've got some breaking news. Now, we often talk about the love of the horse on this program. Very few people have a closer bond mm. with these majestic athletes than our next guest. The host of Bread to Win and Thoroughbreds Argo on Sky Racing. Plus, she does so many other things, it's very hard to keep up. Carolyn Searcy, it's great to have you back on Racing Dreams. Thanks for joining us in studio. Thank you for having me, Julie and Tim. It's fabulous to be back here on a Saturday morning. Yeah. Uh, well, last time you were in here, I was in New Zealand. We really have gone global, <laughs> we haven't have. we? We're it's on the been, move these been quite, days. It's been quite a five years. Now, um, what about this carnival? It's been a crackerjack carnival. Oh, hasn't it? Honestly, you know, when you look at the way it's extended now, the, the Tab Everest Carnival, honestly, going right through from the early days, you know, we start with the, the you know, early two-year-old and three-year-old races and then it comes all the way through. We've had the Everest now, mm. we're into Spring Champion Stakes Day, the Calendar Presnell and more to come as well. That's the exciting thing. Of course, the Golden Eagle, the Golden Gift, this carnival just stretches on for so long and I think the, the crowds that we've had, I think it's hard to keep the good crowds because it's got to stretch out a lot more now. But we've still seen such a fabulous vibe on every single race day at Randwick and Rose Hill. And it's been just fantastic to be a part of. Well, you talk about the crowds, you know, close to 50,000 were there on Everest Day. But every Carnival Day, there has been phenomenal attendance. And it is exactly as Peter Volandis has wanted. It is that younger generation. All of a sudden, they are wanting to be at the racetrack. Yeah, that's right. Racing New South Wales has put so much into this Everest Carnival. And, you know, Everest Day itself, what I was really struck by was the fact that there were so many, as you say, young people, but so many people that were happy. I mean, particularly, you know, the ATC staff, a lot of them had worked all week yeah. on events, morning, noon and night, and they were there with smiles on their faces. They were really happy to be there. And that rubbed off on the crowd too. Everywhere, if you ran into someone, you know, it was so busy, you're sort of bumping into people left, right and centre walking through Randwick. But as you did so, you know, even young blokes or older blokes yeah. or, you know, everyone's like, oh, sorry, sorry, love, you know, yeah. whatever. It was all just so happy. That was, that was the great thing. Take sorry, on. love. I don't, know whether, I, know. I don't know whether you can get away with that. I mean, sorry, um, now, that was look, for a young fella. Yeah, I, I, like, oh, I okay. tape all your programs as we always do every week and we all love this industry. It really caught my eye that story on Bread to Win about the politicians and uh, the politicians interacting with key people in this industry. Oh, look, it was a great evening. This was at Parliament House in Canberra last week, organised by Thoroughbred Breeders Australia. And all the federal politicians were there. Anthony Albanese, had, I think it was a, a science awards night. He wasn't there. But we had Murray Watt, the federal agriculture minister. We had, um, you know, David, a little proud for the head of the nationals. And, and all of the... It was such a bipartisan night. So we had also Nola Marino and Meryl Swanson from, you know, both sides of politics who were the co-conveners. And what it actually did was... was actually that the racing and breeding industry understand that there are so many politicians from regional areas mm. that really do understand our industry. And the most important thing for racing and breeding was to be able to show, I mean, here we are at Widden Stud, showing that, you know, the amount of staff that the industry employs. Exactly. The fact it is an agricultural industry, it is not just about wagering. Obviously, wagering is a huge part of mm. it. But it is a, a massive industry employing so many people and putting so much money back into government coffers as well. And the, the takeout from the night was that the politicians really, really understand that. And the more meetings we have, like, 
like this. You know, Michael McCormack talking about, mm. he's the member for Riverina, talking about through COVID, ringing Peter Volandes and mm. Greg Nichols and saying, look, you need to get a plan in place so that you keep racing going. So we keep that wagering revenue through the COVID period. And that was what was able to happen. So the importance of federal politicians and state and, and everyone else to, to the racing and breeding industry is just so important. Mm. And it's no longer just what's happening uh, in the racing fraternity. Now it's life beyond the track for these mm -hmm. thoroughbreds Very of much. ours. And uh, we're talking about it this morning. We've got Equimillion. That was a huge success. We've got uh, Kathy O'Hara in the Daily Telegraph today talking about this new Magic Millions show jumping <laughs> event. So it's really, we're now seeing the industry really embracing the next chapter for the thoroughbreds. Yeah, look, a lot of people have done a lot of work in this space for a long time, but now it's become so important for the industry, social licence. You know, we really need to be showing that these in, this thoroughbred athletes are cared for off the track. And there are so many great programs around Australia that are part of that. But Equimillion was part of the, the way that, um, you know, giving good funding to off-track competition drives demand for thoroughbreds off the track. And we're seeing a lot more Equimillion, as you said, the new Magic Millions um, competition where they're going to put money towards Equine Pathways, which is a great organisation that gives to, you know, people that are riding, you know, with disabilities that are able to get on horseback and really connect with these horses. So there are so many jobs thoroughbreds can do. And it is about telling the stories. But more importantly, it's about actually finding them new homes. Mm -hmm. And that's what all these programs are seeking to do. And they're doing very successfully at the moment. There's still more to do, but it is so so important that, that, you know, we tell the story as well. Shane Rose is one of the great characters and one of the elite equestrian riders in this country. Of course, been to many Olympics. No doubt he'll be in Paris next year. I saw him on a thoroughbred the other day on uh, Thoroughbreds Argo. Yes, yeah, so it's come, actually coming up on Monday night. So oh, we've had uh, the promo running I saw, on well, I must have been, no, I, saw, I saw the promo. I, saw, I, get, oh, look, I, get, I get the first hand information. Yeah, that's it, exactly. Oh, look, it's fabulous here because Shane Rose, he's not only a silver medalist on a thoroughbred uh, at Olympic level, but he also, here he's breaking in a couple of young horses. So he has a pre-training breaking um, property, Bimberdine Park, down in southwest Sydney. And you can see the love he has for these thoroughbreds. That's his horse, the Bandit, who was a Japanese bred horse. He's his next one coming through. He has Virgil, who'll probably take, who is part thoroughbred, by the way, to the 2024 Paris Olympics. But this is ba the Bandit, who's a young horse who's coming through, and he just looks magnificent. So yeah. it's a really interesting interview with Shane on Thoroughbreds Ago on Monday. Also talking about you know, what racing owners can do to rehome their horses and, and the things they need to look for when they're rehoming them. And also, he gives good advice for, for the equestrian people that are taking thoroughbreds on. I mean, he's an absolute expert. He's part of the racing industry, part of the rehoming industry as well, and, and an elite eventer too. Mm. So, great to hear from Shane Rose. Oh, I just adore him. I've watched him yes. many, many <laughs> years now, and I've always just adored him. We have to let you go, sadly. We could talk to you all day. Very big day out here today at uh, Randwick. Any tips for us? Oh, look, I just, well, I'm a bit biased here. In the spring champion, <laughs> each way, glad you think so for John Sargent. I think he ran into the gloaming really nicely and I think he'll go on with the job the summer, so you think, in the spring champion. Fingers crossed, each way. I just had an each way bet. He's good odds, so that's all, why I got All care, no responsibility. That's it. Caroline, good to see you. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Julie. Thanks. Stay with us. Coming up after the break, we're back to Newmarket, to the United Kingdom, to catch up with legendary trainees, an absolute legend, this guy, William Haggis. It is always great to have your company on Racing mm. Dreams, as it's always day. Good to have Julie's company. Likewise. We've got three weeks left of the I'm series. Just it's just gone like that. Glad to have you back. You've been overseas. I've already been away for a few days. <laughs> Surely I wasn't that. You I mean, far, far away though. Yeah, it's I did, a I long way. Covered more ground than the early explorers. <laughs> uh, this guy knows how uh, travel can be in this racing industry. He's been around it for a long, long time with a surname like Brassel from Racing New South Wales. Mark Brassel, how are you? I'm very well, Tim. Yourself? Good, good, good. Uh, Mr Brassel, big day of racing here today in Sydney, but, geez, it's a bit cooler outside. I, I was just thinking that. I'm here at Michael Friedman's. It's uh, actually a little bit breezy, and on one, one side of the uh, equation here, we've got a dog gnawing on these big bones. I don't know where they get them, but... Gee, they're well fed. Yeah. Look, you're looking sartorially elegant. The only thing missing is a little glass of Moet and Chandon. That is a lovely way to get into the Spring Champion Stakes today. It's a good race. That's, yeah, that'll be later. But, uh, yeah, it's a great race, isn't it? Always is. Uh, I, I sort of fancy Gay's Raff attack. I, as uh, was touched on earlier by Shane O'Cassie, um, the, 
the gay Waterhouse Adrian Bone and Muscle there is so hard to run down. This horse is super fit. I think you'll give it a great shot, great, great shake at big odds. We also have the invitation today. Another great race. It's only in its third edition. Uh, Karen McAvoy, he's won the last two like he did with the Everest, just straight out of the gates and takes a couple of $2 million races. Uh, but Cathy O'Hara, she is just in sensational form. She is, isn't she? She's riding very well. Uh, this is another great race. It's taken off very quickly. $2 million race. It's, what, it's uh, third or fourth running. Uh, Karen McAvoy's on fire too, and uh, he's got some great mounts there today. So looking forward to the racing. And I love seeing uh, great names, great people mm. being acknowledged in this industry. Kenny Callender, wonderful man, love him, as is Max Presnell. And uh, we do have the Callender Presnell today. Yeah, yeah, honouring two great men, Maxie Presnell and Kenny Callender. Uh, you know, I was a young bloke when I first entered uh, racing in the newsroom and uh, they were people we admire, we still admire. They're just great men and it's, it's really good of Racing New South Wales and the board and PVL to uh, honour these guys. So uh, they'll both be out there today and uh, it'll be a cracking race, no doubt. Well, speaking of PVL, I mean, this man knows how to get an invite. He's been to Buckingham Palace, which is my absolute dream. Now he's at the White House. He's Group 1, isn't he? He, he <laughs> can find a gig. I mean, I, I was only thinking, when I, when I read the menu, if uh, Billy's pies and hot chips aren't on the, the after-dinner menu, well, he's going to blow up big time. <laughs> Well, look, if he's got anything to do with it, I bet you there were a few hot village pies coming out there because they are... And it doesn't matter how many you eat, there's no limit to the little ones. You know, there's, it's a bit like if you're having a glass of wine when you're cooking and they don't count. Um, Is that the rule? Yeah, apparently. That's, that's a rule that someone told me many, many years ago. What about... Uh, there's the dog. There's the dog. Finish the bone just over your shoulder. Um, what about Golden Eagle Day? Uh, yeah, at Rose Hill Gardens. You and I have big Westies. Um, should be a cracking day next week. It'll, it'll be fantastic. It, uh, it's a day where we're, we're trying to promote as a, uh, a family-friendly friend, day, uh, get the kids along. It'll be a, a fantastic afternoon. And, and look at this race. Like, it's, it's only been run, what, three times and lost... Uh, uh, not lost and running. Uh, I wish I win. And fangirl, you know, go across the line. I wish I wins since as one of TJ runs second and an Everest. And Fangirl, she's, uh, she's gone on and won the, the inaugural uh, King Charles. And she's one of the favourites for that race down south, whatever it's called. The it's called Colac the Cox Plate. Plate. Whatever. <laughs> it's the Wait for Age, the wait for that, age Championship yeah, of forgot. Australia. Let's not get too territorial. <laughs> um, look, they do race down there, don't they? <laughs> Just occasionally. Um, Your contract will get signed again. According to the stats that I have in front of me, um, according to the stats that I have in front of me, very minimal, but... Regardless of that, uh, you have a perfect record on the show. So do you have a tip today? I do. Uh, look, it's, it's not a flash price, but uh, it's a horse that really took me the other day in the Everest day, sequestered in race four. I think she's about uh, six to four, two dollars fifty. But uh, the way she won, like she's, she's got a, uh, a big baldy face. You'd swear someone's thrown a milk carton at her. <laughs> Uh, you'll see her, she'll be back, but she'll finish like a steam train. And I think, uh, you know, she'll go on to a lot better things than today. So uh, sequestered for me. I, Adam Hieronymus. I'm going to use the milk. Uh, I just don't yeah. ever want you to describe me ever, Mark. I would hate well, to hear what you probably, say about probably, people. Probably wraps up me nicely. Uh, look, the sun looks like it's breaking. The dogs have finished gnawing on the bone. Let's do it again before this season's out, Brass. Can, yeah, oh, for sure. Can I just say, I did pinch that from the, the late, great Les Carlion. He said that about Rough Habit, who had a big baldy face. So I did pinch it. Oh, that's OK, <laughs> mate. Well, you, well, you, you pinched it well. Please. We'll talk to you soon, brother. Good on you. Thank you very much. All the best. Thank you. <laughs> you, just, you just never know where it's going to go, and I love that. I want I more of him. I love that. I want more of him. I love him. <sighs>
All right. Well, often we say our uh, uh, racing here in Australia is the envy of the world and we attract some of the best horses from overseas. Of course, who could forget Dubai honour winning this year's Randvet and Queen Elizabeth Stakes in the autumn? Absolutely, Jules. And the brilliant five-year-old will be back in Sydney in 2024. As we've seen, I was on assignment in the United Kingdom this week and made my way to Newmarket to chat to his trainer, the great William Haggis. Racing dreams, we've made our way to the United Kingdom and to Horse Heaven. This is Newmarket and we are joined by one of the world's leading horse trainers. Many in Australian racing will know this man, William Haggis, how are you? Very good, thank you. Welcome. Oh, it's good to be here. Wonderful to be here. First, in your eyes, uh, can you give us a little bit of insight into what's happening here with Tattersalls? Well, we've, we're currently in the first day of the horse in training sale. We had sold probably 1,500 yearlings over the last month. Um, quite a long sessions, long sessions they were. This is a long day, but the yearlings where the dream begins, and the horse in training sales where the nightmare ends. Okay. okay. <laughs> now, uh, what about this amazing relationship between this part of the world and Australian racing? Because it is truly global now. Well, it really is. I mean, racing all over the world. Obviously, Australia is the furthest we go, but there's lots of stuff in the Middle East and, and in the Far East, but. Australia is particularly appealing, probably because of the prize money, but also there's always this relationship between England and Australia, how you and your enormous country pick on us poor people <laughs> uh, living on a postage stamp. It's terrible. Uh. But whether it's rugby, cricket or horse racing, it's all good stuff. A Dave the inside at Dunn Premium. Very elegant goes to third, but a Dave's full of running at the 100 metres. In fact, he's ripping clear now. And a big win for a Dave and the Queen Elizabeth Stakes. What about our Dave? Uh, it was oh, just marvelous. extraordinary. Extraordinary. And those ding-dong battles with very elegant. Yeah, it was great. And we, we've had we have a good relationship with Chris and uh, he's as, as sporting and as generous as anyone who loves the challenge and uh, they had a, we had a couple of great days the first year and then very elegant beat us in the Ranvit easily so we had to put a pair of blinkers on, but the horse lifted his uh, game and he, he managed to beat her just. It's a Dave, he's fighting. Very elegant, the outside. She's trying her hardest. It's a Dave and very elegant in a ripping finish. A Dave's lifting. He fends off very elegant and Dallas Ann. And a Dave goes back to back. The beast of Britain's done it. A Dave by three quarters to very elegant. Now Dubai honour. Well, he won very well. He won the Ranvet very well. I was very impressed with him that day. He won the Queen Elizabeth well. He's better with a bit of cut in the ground. He, he had a run the other day in the Champions States. He ran a really solid race, but he wasn't ready. And he'll be prepared now for the Ramvit and the Queen Elizabeth Stakes for all being well. In my opinion, he's absolutely fine. We've got some x-rays in the repository. Yeah. Have a look. He's light, but he's a stayer. He ran the other day, you know that. He won about two weeks ago. You're looking forward to coming back? Yeah, very much so, absolutely. But how do you see Australian racing? What do you think of it? Well, I love it. I watch it every, every week, mainly on a, a Wednesday and a Saturday. I watch it early in the morning. I'm an early riser and not a very late, uh, and not a night owl at all. But I watch every moment of it, especially during the carnivals. And I love it. Well, you found that Canterbury set up pretty good when you bring the horses in? Fantastic. We've been welcomed like long lost friends. It's fantastic. And the, the welcome that the, our staff in particular get, I mean, I came down for a week, it was great. But the welcome our staff get was absolutely first rate and uh, they can't wait to go. Once I say we're doing this, that and the next uh, uh, February, March, there's a queue to go. How many horses do you think for the autumn rule? Will it only be Dubai? I'd like to send four. Yep. At the moment, I've got three on the list and looking for maybe for another one this week. Finally, William, uh, you mentioned uh, you get welcome with open arms. It's a bit of a signpost to the industry. I've been covering sport for 30 odd years, this closely for five. But one of the things I've noticed is even when we came here, it's just like doors just open. People have that sense of camaraderie. Yeah, I think very much so. And racing's fairly unique, really. It, it, it obviously appeals 
in Australia to a lot of people, but in England to only the committed, mainly through betting, but a lot through the love of the horse. And, um, you know, we have a wonderful product which has to be enjoyed, and it's enjoyed everywhere in the world. Wherever you go, if you go to Sydney or to California or to Paris, whatever you do, uh, everyone is, um, I think, respectful and pleased to welcome other people from the same industry, and I think it's great. Dubai on his cutting loose. This is what we've been waiting for. Unicorn Lion being grabbed by Dubai on her, and Animo in the middle. It's Dubai on her hitting the lead from Animo. They beat off Unicorn Lion, but Dubai on her is drawing clear, and William Haggis has done it again. Dubai on her by three lengths to Animo. Welcome back. You're watching Racing Dreams. Big day ahead here and in Victoria. Racing analyst Brad Gray joins us now. Good morning to you, Brad. Yes, good morning, guys. Spring Champion Day. The show just rolls on, doesn't it? One week it's the Everest, the next week Spring Champion, and next week, of course, the Golden Eagles. So, yep, the show just rolls on. Yeah, it's, a, it's an almost uh, an autumn day or mm. almost wintry day for, for the big race today, of course, and uh, the focus is on uh, the spring champion stakes. But uh, what about race five, the Brian Crowley stakes? Yeah, it is a bit wintry. We actually had to put the pants on today. So that's, that's a pretty good <laughs> guide in terms that. of the weather at the moment. But no, that's Brian Crowley. <laughs> 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 Brian Crowley, Keenan. So trained by Gabe Wardhouse and Adrian Bott. Now, this is a stable that are just firing, aren't they? All their runners are airborne. So you don't see too many horses make a leap from maiden grade straight into a, a black type race. But I think he's given the right profile, the right, the right pr platform to do that. Uh, he'll go forward, he'll make his own luck, control the race. and. Uh, he'll give some cheek from out in front in a race. It's fallen away a little bit after scratching, so Keenan in the Brian Crowley. Race six, we have the Craven Plate of 1,800 metres. Yeah, this looks like a battle of tactics, guys. I can't find a lot of pressure on paper. Uh, so you're dealing with a few horses that are probably getting towards the end of their career, a few uh, seven, eight-year-old geldings uh, who like to... And Numerian's the type of horse that he likes to roll forward. Uh, we saw first up that he went back from a wide draw. That played against him. I thought he was quite good through the line, despite being beaten a fair way. So they'll use the gate today. Adam Hieronymus rides. He'll ride the speed. He'll control the race and he'll give a kick from out in front. So the last time he raced second up, uh, he wasn't beaten far by Cascadian in a Group 1 over 2,000 metres. So a repeat of that, and he's the horse to beat New Marion. The punters have stayed with Tom Kitten. They have, and I've stayed with him too, Tim. So we'll stick loyal. Poor old Tom, uh, since winning first up, the up-and-coming, not a lot has gone right for him. Despite that, he's still been fighting out the finish. So... We cross our fingers and hold our breath that he can just angle off the fence at the right time. He's drawn barrier one. Again, Adam Hieronymus rides. And if he can just hold a spot, maybe better than midfield, I think he's too good for these. So the wild card in the race is the filly, two to La Vida. And there's a few smart judges out there tipping her as well because fillies have a, a really good recent record in this race. But I think everything has a line for Tom Kitten. We know James Cummings from Godolphin is a fantastic grand final trainer. And this is the race that he's had eyes for all campaigns. So if you've been with Tom, like me, stick with him. Give him one more chance. All right, well, following the spring champion stakes, we have the $2 million, the invitation, only a relatively new concept in its third edition uh, this year. We've said it a couple times this morning, Karen McAvoy, he's taken out the first two, much like he did the Everest. Can he do it today? I think he can, yeah. He's got a fair pedigree when it comes to these big races, doesn't he? Karen McAvoy, a big-time rider, absolutely. And he's on... The plum ride here, Espiona. So we're talking about a horse that was only beaten two and a half lengths in an Everest, if you don't mind. So if you're only beaten two and a half lengths in a race of that stature, you are so hard to beat. Out to 1,400 metres, back to Mare's grade. She's another one that will need luck at the right time. She likes to get back, find her feet and come with a rush. And she doesn't have the most... Uh, I guess standard uh, action. She's a, a mare that likes to get her head on the side, or she doesn't like to, but she tends to do that. But despite that, she's got a massive engine. I think she's going as well as ever. So luck at the right time. She is going to be mighty hard to beat, and the punters agree because she's been well back this morning. So Espiona, come back in career best form, and she's clearly the horse to beat in the invitation. Can Alligator Blood win the Cox Plate, do you think? Yeah, he can. Absolutely, he can. He's got that beautiful uh, Mooney Valley racing style, doesn't he? He'll go forward. Uh, he can absorb pressure. He's been up for a while, so he is a horse that's at the top of his game, and he comes off a career-best win, so I'm not going to say no. I'm actually with Militarise in the Cox Plate, the, the three-year-olds. He's just got such a good weight, doesn't he? 49 kilos, and if he can hold a spot, 
I like that Golden Rose form, and you forgive the fact that he, he was there midfield in, in the Caulfield Guineas where he got a, a long way back in the run. So this is another horse with a long range plan to come to this race, militarised, and these three-year-olds just get such a huge weight advantage. And you've got to appreciate that Chris Waller too, he always thinks a few steps ahead and that seems to be exactly what he's done with this ride for um, Militarise as well. Brad, just quickly talk us through your roughies and your best bets for today. We'll roll the graphic. Yep, so you've got the calendar Presnell and with Arctic Glamour, that's not a roughie. Uh, she's certainly well found, but she's hard enough to beat. So I did hear Mark Brussels say that Sequestered is going to be hard to beat. So hopefully she's got broad shoulders. She's going to be carrying all of us. Sequestered, that's in race four. I've made her the best bet across the meeting. And the best roughie comes up a little bit early at race two, Atmosphere. He was very disappointing first up. I do concede that, but it was one of those runs that was too bad to be true. So overlook that, and you go to his best form through last campaign, and if he rediscovers his best, he's too good for these. And around Ten dollars, yeah, I think it's a really good gamble in race two atmosphere. Atmosphere, all right, I like it. And uh, Arctic glamour down there with the calendar Presnell. I, I just think it's fantastic to be honouring uh, names like Kenny Calendar and Max Presnell because they are mm. just legends, wonderful people too, um, really good guys. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. So I know Mark said a little bit earlier in the show that he's he was he was coming through the, the greys there in racing. Uh, he they were two people that he looked up and admired. And when I came into racing, uh, they were probably uh, towards the back end of their careers. But I echo that sentiment 100%. Two guys that I admire greatly. Uh, and as you say, Tim, two guys that will just give you the shirt off their back uh, all the time in the world for anybody coming through. And uh, always happy to lend an ear. When you uh, when you need it, so yeah, yeah. two good guys, and absolutely, uh, absolutely, to everybody out the same that deserve a race. Yeah, good to see you got your pants on, and um, keep them on for for next <laughs> for, for next Saturday. We'll be at Rose Hill for Golden Eagle Day. <laughs> yep, I will be pants on and all. <laughs> all right, thanks, Brad. See you then. Thank you also to our great sponsors. Our show would not be possible without your support. Of course, Racing New South Wales, Arrowfield and Bet365 as well. Uh, we will see you trackside next Saturday for the big one. Yeah, New Haven Park, Godolphin. There's so many people around the show. And, and thanks to Tattersalls at Newmarket. We'll see you next week. See you next week. Bye.